Okay, guys, I think we will start the evening lecture. So uh, thank you, Andre, for coming. Today we have Andrew Lampinen. He's a senior research scientist at DeepMind. And uh, prior to that, he did his PhD in Stanford in cognitive psychology, right? And he has really interesting work on how language and memory and embodiment can make more general and more flexible models. So really interesting interested in hearing more about his work. Thank you for coming, Andrew. Thanks very much for that kind introduction and for having me here today and for coming out at 5 p.m. to hear me talk. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to tell you about some work we've done recently on passive learning of active causal strategies in agents and language models. And I'm very excited to tell you about this work because it's one of the few projects that actually brings together a lot of the threads of research that I've been doing over the past few years on reinforcement learning agents and language models, what you can learn from explanations, and touches on some topics in causality and philosophy and cognitive science that I'm quite interested in. But because of that, it might be a little bit of a whirlwind tour, so we'll see how this goes. So I want to start off with the observation that passive observation generally can't distinguish between causal structure and just correlations. So you might notice that when this person is around, cars are much more likely to be broken, but you don't know which way the causal arrow is going, if any way, or that people with canes are more likely to have gray hair, but that doesn't mean necessarily that having a cane makes you go gray, or that a crowd cheers when the team scores. So what we need to do as scientists is to do experiments where we actually intervene on the world, and that helps us to determine its causal structure. So for example, you might bring your car to the mechanic and actually rather than braking, it starts working better or you give people a vaccine and you see how it affects their health outcomes. And this uh, idea of intervention has been formalized by Judea Pearl, among others, in this language of causal DAGs and the do calculus. So the way this works is that a causal DAG is a causal directed acyclic graph. What does that mean? There are some nodes, which we can think of as being variables that roughly correspond to some abstract states of the world, and edges, which are causal effects with a direction. Like when your car is broken, you bring it to the mechanic, not the other way around. And what Perl introduced is this do operator, which allows you to set the state of one or more of these nodes. So for example, you might do an intervention where you bring a car to the mechanic, and then you see what happens to the other variables in the system. Or you could do an intervention where you break a car. Maybe I would do that to someone else's car rather than my own. And then later I would see that the car ends up with the mechanic. And from these kinds of experiments, I can infer that the causal structure of the world is more likely to go, ah, the car is broken, then it ends up with a mechanic rather than the other way around. So building on this framework, Pearl introduced this causal hierarchy where at the bottom level, you just have this sort of correlational knowledge or associational knowledge, which is how things inter relate to each other in the data, purely observational. The second level, you have intervention, where you actually do interventions on the world and see what happens. The third level, you have counterfactuals. I'm not going to get into it much today, but I'd love to talk about it more offline. And because of this hierarchy, Perl has quite frequently expressed a lot of skepticism about what modern machine learning methods are capable of achieving. So this is a quote from one of his papers from a few years back. This hierarchy and the formal restrictions it entails explains why statistics-based machine learning systems are prevented from reasoning about actions, experiments, and explanations, denigrates the impressive achievements of deep learning to the level of association, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is pretty disappointing. But of course, it would lead you to ask, well, what machine learning systems do we have that could do interventions in the world? And there are some, and they are reinforcement learning agents. So, What's a reinforcement learning agent? Well, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but just to give you a sketch, the idea of reinforcement learning is that you have a, some sort of task you want a system to perform. Like, let's say I'm stressed preparing for this talk, and so I ask my RL agent to get me some ice cream, please. Then the RL agent goes out and takes a series of actions in the world. Maybe it gets me some healthy vegetables. That doesn't make me very happy, so I give it a bad reward. Then it tries again, goes out and performs a series of actions, gets some ice cream, and that makes me happy, so I give it a positive reward. And from just the sort of happy, unhappy signal, the reinforcement learning agent is supposed to learn about its task and how to execute it. But the important point to note is that 
when the reinforcement learning agent is taking actions in the world, it's actually doing those actions. It's performing interventions on the world. And what that means is that because the agent is able to do things in the environment, it's not fundamentally limited from discovering causal structure. And indeed, there's been quite a lot of prior work showing that reinforcement learning agents can learn the process of inferring this causal structure if you teach it to them enough time. So here's a selection of papers. So how does this work? Well, basically what you do is you take a reinforcement learning agent, you put it in a situation where it can do interventions on the world on some sort of causal structure, like maybe it can break some cars, and then you let it see what happens and you let it infer some causal structure, you test that inference in some way and you reward it if it gets it right. And if you do this across enough causal structures, that's the meta-learning part, you expose it to a lot of different causal structures, you'll find that the reinforcement learning agent is capable of discovering a strategy that's relatively reliable for discovering causal structures and maybe even for use. Okay, but it's not 2019 anymore. Everybody's excited about language models now, so I can't just come tell you about a bunch of RL agents doing some toy causal tasks, sadly. <clears throat> so, what is language model training? Well, it's different because language models do not take actions in the world during training. All they do is they passively predict the next token in someone else's language. So you take a cor corpus of text on the internet written by some humans or in a library or off the radio, as you heard about in the earlier talk, and you just take a giant transformer and you pass that text through a transformer in tokenized form, which I hope you heard about already. Transformer attends to the earlier tokens and just tries to predict what the next token in the sentence is going to be. And you can think of this training as basically being imitation learning or behavioral cloning on human language. So you're taking somebody else's language actions and you're just imitating them without doing those interventions yourself. Behavioral cloning, if you haven't heard this term before, is just a fancy way of saying doing passive imitation learning on somebody else's data. <clears throat> okay, and this has led a number of people, including Quirrell and others, to argue that language models because of this fundamentally observational passive learning are limited. They can't discover causal structure. And that's not only argued on Twitter, but also in papers like this one. Causal parrots, large language models may talk causality, but they're not actually causal. There's a tension though, because there's been another stream of work suggesting that language models can in some cases do some sophisticated and kind of interactive things that one might think of as requiring causal understanding. For example, this paper from Microsoft suggested that language models actually provide very useful priors for causal reasoning mechanisms, even, for example, for uh, causal structure discovery from data. And also there's been a stream of work suggesting that language models can be prompted to interactively use tools such as APIs to achieve a task. But of course, using a tool is a fundamentally interventional uh, action that you're taking upon the world and that leads to the question, well, how could these models do this if they can't learn anything about causal structure? Well, there's a couple of possibilities on how they might be cheating. One is they might just not really be doing some sort of generalizable causal reasoning. They might just be parroting causal structures observed in their training data. And that's basically the argument made by that causal parrots paper I pointed to earlier. But another interesting point is that many of these models were trained or tuned with these ideas like tool interactions and or reinforcement learning before they were deployed. And for many of the systems, we don't even know everything they were trained with. And so we don't know whether it's interactive training that's unlocking these causal abilities or if it's something more fundamental about the language modeling itself. So that's the question that motivated this project. Language models are mostly passively trained. Why is it that they nevertheless show some behaviors that seem at least superficially causal? Are they just cheating or is there something more interesting going on here? And what I'm going to try to suggest to you today is that there's actually two routes that language models could take to causal understanding from the kind of passive learning that they do. The first is I'm going to argue that even if you can't learn about causal structure itself from passive data, you can learn about generalizable causal strategies that would allow you to go out <clears throat> at test time if you can intervene on in the world as a language model can when it's talking to a user and actually infer causal structure. And the second argument I'm going to make is that explanations are powerful. They're sort of a gateway to discovering causal structure because that's precisely what they're intended to do. So to dig into this in a little detail, 
why might high causal strategies be learnable even if causal structure itself isn't? Well, basically the point of my argument is that agents need to do interventions at test time if they're going to be able to discover the causal structure that's there at test time and take advantage of that knowledge. But it's actually not clear whether the systems need to do an interaction, any interventions at training time. For example, the language models might be able to discover some strategy from their training data that they're able to deploy at test time actively. And <clears throat> one of the important points here is that even though the models are observing this passive data that was created by someone else generating language, that data itself is interventional. It is people, for example, having conversations on the internet where they go back and forth and each of those statements is an action in that conversation. Or they might more literally be recordings or descriptions of experiments someone took, science experiments or others. And so the first question I wanna to try to address in this talk is, could agents learn just from passive imitation a strategy for experimenting and exploiting causal structure that would generalize to novel causal structures. <clears throat> the second question that I want to try to address in this talk, or the second point I want to raise, is that explanations are a unique way of highlighting causal structure. And from cognitive science, we actually think this is one of the fundamental roles of explanations. Explanations are intended to link between a particular situation, like a particular problem on an exam, let's say, and some more abstract principles, which are generalizable or causal, that will help you to solve other problems in the future. And so they're designed to help us learn causal structures that help us to learn and generalize. And so the second question I want to address in this talk is whether explanations could support causal learning. To put that a little more metaphorically, the overall goal of this talk is to ask whether you could learn to be a scientist just by reading enough books that explain some experiments and then go out in the world and discover new causal structures. Does that motivation make sense? Cool. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to go back to some simple toy RL experiments. Not RL experiments, BC experiments. So I always like to start my projects by working in the simplest setting where I can imagine something. And so in this case, what I'm going to do is create the simplest possible causal structure presented in the simple possible, po simplest possible way to a fairly simple agent that is somewhat language model-like and see if it can learn it. And in particular, the agent architecture I'm going to use is a fairly standard reinforcement learning-like agent architecture where we have some modality-specific encoders that take inputs from the world. We have a big transformer memory that remembers past states of the world. <laughs> and we have some sort of policy that takes actions in the world, does interventions. This is a fairly standard architecture, including the transformer memory is quite popular in recent work. And if you kind of squint at it, it's actually not so different from the structure of the language models that you might have seen before. In particular, you can think of the tokenizers and embeddings in a language model as basically being a kind of modality specific encoder. The transformer is, well, you know, that's most of the language model. And the output embeddings and softmax are more or less what an action policy does. And so this is basically my proxy for the first part of this talk for what a language model would be doing. And I'm going to test this model's ability to learn causal structures in a fairly simple in test environment. And in particular, it's just going to be some causal graph over five variables, pretty simple. And the variables are going to have their values set by some linear effect of their ancestors, some noise and a nonlinearity. The agent is going to uh, take actions that correspond to interventions on a single node to set it to a large positive or large negative value. The agent's going to observe the initial values and outcomes. So the agent isn't going to observe the graph structure itself explicitly. What it's going to get is just a vector of numbers, which are the, ver the states of each of these nodes at a given point in time. And then it's going to take some action on the world and it's going to observe the outcome of that action. What happens to the states of those nodes after that intervention? Now, to make this a little bit challenging for the agent, what we're going to do is every episode, we're going to sample a new graph structure from some distribution so that the agent has to sort of figure out what's going on every, every time it wakes up, you could think. And the episodes are going to be divided into a series of trials in two phases. First, we'll give the agent a while to experiment. It's allowed to perform some interventions and see the results without any immediate goal. And the idea is that this will allow the agent to implicitly infer the graph structure that's underlying the current episode. 
Then next, we're going to ask the agent to exploit its prior, what it's discovered. So we're going to give the agent a goal of maximizing some variable and then reward it with the value of that variable after each action it takes. So for example, we might say to the agent, you should maximize variable A. And if the agent is doing a good job, maybe it will intervene on variable C because through these paths, that will increase variable A the most. So how are we going to test the agent's ability to actually do some sort of causal reasoning here? Well, we're going to train it with behavioral cloning on data from an expert, just like language models are trained by behavioral cloning on human language. And what the expert policy is going to do is to intervene on each variable once during the experimentation phase and then act optimally during the exploitation phase. So this is basically the best thing you can do in this environment. Not quite the best experimentation, but it's fine. <clears throat> and in the training data, to make this harder for the model, we're going to set up a training testing split that's based on the causal dependencies. So in particular, in the training data, we're going to make sure that node D here is never an ancestor of node E, either directly or indirectly. So for example, in this graph, this edge could not be inserted during the training phase because it would make E a descendant of node D via node B. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set up a hard test for the agent where it has to maximize the value of E in situations where D is a critical ancestor of E. That is, there's a lot of, basically, D is either the right place to intervene to maximize E, like in this graph structure, D through both these paths contributes to E's value, or D is on the key path to E, but maybe you want to intervene on one of its ancestors instead. It's important to note that the edge weights can be either positive or negative here, but just to make it simple, I'm describing it as though it's positive in these examples. And the point of this training testing split is that it's challenging because during training, the agent has never seen any situation where intervening on node D had any effect on node E. And the question we're going to ask is, is it going to learn a general enough strategy that it can infer from its experimentation that node D is the best place to intervene to influence node E and to generalize its exploitation strategies to take advantage of that knowledge? And what we find is, Basically, it learns this quite well. So over the course of this passive training, we run active evaluations. So in other words, we actually boot up the agent in an environment where it can intervene instead of just testing it on the data. And then we test it on that, and then we throw that data away. We don't train on it because then the agent would have had interventional training. And what we find is that over the course of training, this yellow curve here is the accuracy if you test it on the training uh, causal structures. Very rapidly, it's getting to high accuracy on those, but on either of the test cases, it's also pretty rapidly climbing to fairly high accuracy, and it's a little bit noisy, but it continues to improve at least a bit over the course of training. Okay, but that's in some sense kind of weak evidence that the agents are doing anything causal. There's a bunch of simpler approaches rather than actually doing some kind of causal inference that would allow the agent to achieve some performance on these tasks. These could include some heuristics, like remembering the values of nodes or how they changed after interventions, or using some sort of correlational statistics from the observations, like total correlations or controlling for the effects of other variables. What we did, therefore, was to take all of these uh, heuristic policies and compare them to the agent, as well as comparing an optimal expert policy in yellow. What you can see on this graph is that in the train and both evaluation conditions, the agent is matching the expert policy almost all the time and is matching it much better than any of the heuristic baseline policies. So this suggests that these agents are capable of learning some sort of causal experimentation and exploitation strategies, at least in this super toy environment. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I guess I'd say one thing that's different. So the, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was whether this is different from navigation, where you see someone taking some paths, pieces of paths, and you have to stitch them together. <clears throat> one thing I do want to highlight is that there's a, a kind of large train test split, which cannot be my slides aren't going back on that screen. Interesting. Um, oh, my internet is, uh, yeah. Hopefully it'll come back. Um, anyway, the, the train test split is such that you can't stitch together causal structures you've seen in training and capture all of the causal structures you see in tests. So some of them could be captured that way, but, uh, there's never a dependence between direct dependence between D and E and training, and there is at test time. Um, it is not working. Uh, let me try disconnecting and reconnecting. The the Wi-Fi is uh, yeah, it's the guest Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm turning it off and on. Hopefully that will fix it. Doesn't seem to want to connect, but sorry about that. Um, it just is not. Okay, there we go. Let's see if okay. we can show you. Oh, maybe it's connected, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I think it, I think it's rejoining. Okay. Oh boy. Um, otherwise, I could share the slides with you. No, you can. You can. You can. You can share what by access one of the mobiles. And it says it's connected. It says it's joining. Okay. Yeah. Seems to be. Yeah. Uh, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Hopefully it won't happen again. Um, okay. So at least in these toy experiments, agents are able to passively learn some cost strategies. <laughs> Let me just finish answering that question. I think there's something fundamentally different about learning causal structures than about stitching together paths, but it is an interesting question and I'm happy to talk about it more offline. Thank you. Um, so one thing I, uh, basically one of the things I'm going to try to do in some of the next phase of this talk is to uh, introduce some slightly less toy settings for this and show that it still works. So the first thing that we did was just try this in a setting where the experiments were a little bit more adaptive. So in the prior experiments, the expert policy tried every possible intervention. Of course, that's not a very reasonable way of going about the world. And as a scientist, what we do is we rely on our prior domain knowledge to constrain our hypothesis space and to constrain the kinds of interventions that we're going to try. So we set up a very simple version of this where we just add a bunch of extra variables to the, si the system, but on each episode, only some of them are relevant and we give a multi-hot cue to the agent for which ones are relevant. And the expert policy will only experiment on the relevant variables. Then of course, the agent is still given the possibility of in experimenting on the irrelevant variables and they're also included in its, intervention, uh, its observations so they can distract it. What we do is we hold out subsets of the variables as well as holding out causal dependencies as before and ask the question, can the agent generalize in order to experiment correctly on a novel subset of variables at test time, and then discover and display a dependency that's never appeared in the data as before. And what we find is that the agent, yes, is able to rapidly learn to generalize these cute exploration strategies, and also to use them to exploit well, which you can see a plot in the paper. Okay, so, those are all well and good with some toy causal structured environments, but let's move on to something a little bit more complex. So in this phase of the talk, I'm going to tell you about some odd one out environments. And in order to do that, I'm going to take a little bit of a parenthetical divergence and tell you about some prior work that was actually done with reinforcement learning agents. So 
We introduced these environments and some of the concepts in this prior paper. Tell me why explanations support learning relational and causal structure. So I'm going to go through and introduce them. The motivation for this work starts with the point that human learning is fundamentally pedagogical and it's really focused on explanation. For example, when you take an exam, you don't just get a score like, yes, you got this right or wrong. You'll often also get an explanation of what you did right or wrong and why. And this is very different from the kind of learning I showed you for reinforcement learning agents before, where they just get a sort of happy or sad signal of how well they did. So what we did in this work is we introduced some tasks that are quite hard for these agents to learn from just this happy, sad signal. And these tasks are what we call the odd one out tasks. So this task, basically what you have to do is figure out which of these objects is the odd one out, which is unique in some way. This is a pretty easy task for humans to do. In this case, it's the green one. But we make it hard for the agents by having the objects have many different features and vary along each, come along most of them in pairs. And what this means is that if you look at proper subsets of the objects, they don't reveal the answer. So for example, in this subset here, this object could be unique because it's the biggest, or this one could be unique because it's green, or this one could be unique because of its uh, shape or texture. And so what that means is that you have to look at all the subsets of the objects and all of their relations along all the property dimensions in order to figure out which object is actually unique. And that makes it a pretty hard problem to learn if you just give, get a signal like happy, sad for your answer. And indeed, we showed in this paper that reinforcement learning agents struggle to learn these tasks from reward alone. So what we propose to do in this prior work is to give explanations as a kind of auxiliary signal for learning, a bit like they might be for humans. So we could give explanations of why an agent got a reward, like when it chooses this object, we could give it an explanation like correct, that object is uniquely green. Or, and that sort of corresponds to what a teacher might give on an exam explaining why an answer was correct or incorrect. Or we could give explanations of objects' properties when the agent encounters them. And you could think of that as more like how a human, uh, how a parent might explain something to a child the first time they see it. You could argue about whether descriptions are explanations, but that's a broader topic. So how do we use these explanations to help the agent learn? Well, what we ask the agent to do is to predict explanations during the training process. So the agent, when it takes an action, is going to predict any sort of explanation the teacher might give. Like maybe the agent chooses this object and set, predicts that the teacher will say it's correct because it's uniquely a large object. But when the teacher in fact says that's incorrect, other objects are large purple striped or pentagons, the agent can learn from this difference between what it predicted and what actually happened in order to improve its representations. What does that look like more explicitly? Well, remember our agent looks something like this. And all we're going to do is to tack an extra head onto it, which is going to output an explanation prediction going to get some actual explanation from the environment and is going to learn by cross entropy loss, which is exactly how language models are trained to predict language. And the idea of all of this is that hopefully because of this extra loss, the agent will get some better representations in its memory and in its modality encoders that allow it to solve the task more accurately. And that's indeed what we find. So when we train reinforcement learning on agents on these tasks, either situated in this 2D environment, you can see down here, or this more complicated 3D one, you can see here, agents trained with explanations in purple are doing pretty well in both environments. Agents trained without explanations learn a bit in the 2D environment and very little in the 3D environment. Cool, so explanations can help reinforcement learning agents to learn odd one out tasks. Yes. Yeah, so the it's it's basically taking a, a fairly standard RL agent architecture, and it's just adding a an extra output to it, which is a very simple output that's just doing this extra prediction learning of explanations. And that's autoregressive, right? So it's unrolls over the. Yeah. Okay. No, I was wondering to what if, uh, to what extent the, the architecture can have an effect on on the like the number of parameters, things like that, you know, the usual yeah. things. So, so great question. So the, one of the nice things about this is that at test time, you don't get any explanations and you don't need them either, although the agent could produce them. So at test time, the parameters are exactly the same. And the total number of parameters added here is actually really tiny. It's a single layer LSTM oh. that's doing this prediction. And the vast majority of the parameters were already in this agent. Okay, thanks. 
<laughs> we also have a bunch of control conditions with fake explanations and other things in the paper you can check out. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the parenthetical. Let's get back to this passive learning setting. So in that work, we also considered another task, which is a bit more like the experimentation and exploitation tasks I told you about before. The way this task works is that there's actually some latent correct feature on each episode, which the agent cannot observe. And you can think of this as basically being some latent causal structure where there's multiple features that could contribute to reward, but only one of them actually does on any given episode. So what the agent, then we give the agent an ability to take interventions on the environment. In particular, we give it a magic wand that lets it transform the properties of objects. And then the agent can do experiments where, for example, it transforms an object's shape, then that object becomes unique along the shape dimension, can choose it, see if it gets a reward, doesn't. So on the next trial, maybe it'll transform the texture of an object, see if it gets a reward, doesn't. So it's transform color on the third trial, maybe it gets a reward then, and it can infer that color is the correct dimension in this episode. It can infer this causal structure implicitly. And then we give it a deconfounded test trial where there are different objects that are unique along each dimension, and the agent gets a large reward if it chooses the one that's unique along the correct dimension. And we can also give explanations during training, just like we did on the earlier tasks, that talk about, for example, the fact that this is correct because the latent feature is color, and this object is uniquely teal. I want to highlight, of course, though, that these tasks are more complex than the causal DAG task because they're grounded in these high dimensional observations. They're partially observable and so on. So this is what these tasks actually look like. The agent is this white square here. It gets to move around this environment where there's some objects in a room, and then it can go up to an object, maybe at the bottom left, transform its shape, and then take that object to check what it's, uh, whether it gets a reward. But the important Point here is that this is a pretty hard perceptual problem for the agent to solve. And some of the objects will not be visible during some parts of the episode. So it also has to remember what it's seen before in order to understand what's going on. Okay, so we train this agent just like the causal DAG agents on passive data from an expert, which intervenes near optimally, not perfectly optimally, <laughs> or sorry, acts near optimally, not perfectly optimally to discover the latent structure and then uses it to achieve reward. And what we find is that in this setting as well, agents are capable of generalizing these strategies from passive data. We did two trained test splits, which I'm not going to get into, but in either case, the agents do about equally well in training in yellow or in evaluation shown in green here and purple here. And as in the reinforcement learning work, explanations help to support that passive learning. So all of these curve, all of these plots show the different train and test sets for the different splits. And in uh, pink, you see the learning with explanations. In blue, you see the learning without explanations. And the interesting things to note are, first of all, the agents with explanations are always doing better. But second, the differences are not nearly as dramatic as they were for the reinforcement learning agents, which had a very hard time learning these intervention tasks without explanations at all. And I suspect this is because getting to see the expert policy actually gives the agents more information about the tasks than just learning from these happy, sad signals from rewards. But I'm not 100% sure about that. In any case, this suggests that agents can passively learn causal strategies in more complex environments, and explanations can at least help to support that learning. But I want to highlight something a little bit more fundamental that explanations can do that might be very relevant to thinking about how systems like language models can generalize. And that's that explanations can shape how a system generalizes out of distribution. So to test this hypothesis, what we did is we set up a version of these tasks where the features are confounded. So in this version of the task, this object is unique, but it's unique in a bunch of different ways. It's got a unique color, unique shape, and a unique texture. And so if the agent is rewarded for choosing this object, it can't tell which of these features is correct. These features are confounded. So we're going to train the agent in situations like this and test it in situations that are deconfounded, like in the prior test trials, where there's one object that has unique texture, one has unique color, and one has a unique shape. What we're going to ask is, how can we push around what the agent does on this out of distribution deconfounded test based on the training experience? And in particular, what we tried to do was give explanations that focused on a particular feature dimension. So we could give the agent, when it chooses this triangle, either an explanation focusing on its color, 
like incorrect, other objects are purple, or it's shape, other objects are triangles, or it's texture. And we're going to, what we did was we did a between agents manipulation where we trained different, different populations of agents with these different manipulations. And of course, you might ask, well, how could the agent know that triangle refers to the shape, not the color, if the features are confounded here? And the answer, of course, is that on another episode, the features relations would be confounded still, but the features would appear in different combinations. And so the agent could see that ah, this is a triangle as well. So it must be the shape that's being referred to by triangle, not some other feature. And what we find is that giving these agents explanations that focus on a single feature dimension can shape the way they generalize out of distribution, even if the agents are learning passively. So this plot, I'm showing you the proportion of the time that in purple, agents that are trained to explain color choose the unique colored object at test time. The blue clear curve shows the proportion of the time that agents trained to explain shape choose the unique shape object. And the green curve shows the proportion of the time that agents trained to explain in terms of texture choose the unique texture object at test time. So basically, giving these explanations is a very strong way of pushing around the agents out of distribution performance. And I want to remind you that the agent isn't forced to use these explanations for the task. We're just using them as a sort of auxiliary supervision. And what I believe is happening here is that the features that are explained just become salient to the agent. So predicting explanations can shape how passively trained agents generalize. <clears throat> Good, still have a bit of time. Okay. So I said I was not going to talk about toy RL agents doing toy tasks, and I talked about it for 40 minutes. So now I'm going to finally get back to some language models. So the fundamental point I want to make is that the internet text from which these models learn is full of descriptions of experiments, their outcomes, and explanations of why they happened. You can find these on Wikipedia in terms of science experiments, or just on Stack Overflow in terms of things people tried when trying to debug a problem, what code they put in, what result they got, and why someone might explain down the thread. <clears throat> so the question is, could language models be learning from this kind of information how to infer causal strategies and how to infer causal structures? So what we did in, this, in the final experiment of this paper was to evaluate language models on the kinds of causal strategy tasks that we explored with the agents. And we, in particular, wanted to test language models that are only trained passively on pure language modeling, unlike some of them that are trained with reinforcement learning and so on. So we used this chinchilla language model from DeepMind with 70 billion parameters. And we took our odd one out intervention task and turned it into a language-based task complete with various kinds of explanations. The hope is that this is a weird enough task to not be in the training text as such, although of course the model will be familiar with some of the features of the task, like the concept of uniqueness. So basically we're taking our task from before where there's an agent doing some magic to transform the shapes of objects, and we're just replacing that agent with chinchilla. This is what this actually looks like. So we give the model textual observations that tell it about the objects in a situation. And then we give it the ability to take interventions. So in particular, we give it a prompt, like there are some objects, here's their descriptions. I transform objects, and then I'm showing you in bold the places where the language model actually gets to make a choice or say something. Uh, so it gets to choose which object it wants to transform, and it gets to choose which feature dimension it wants to intervene on. Then it gets some feedback from the environment, like choosing object C was not rewarded. Then it continues to some more episodes, Finally, it gets a test, like where it gets presented objects that are unique in different ways. This one's a unique shape. This one's a unique, uh, sorry, unique color, unique shape, unique texture. <clears throat> then the model gets to choose which object it wants to take and gets final feedback on the reward. And we can give the model a few shot prompt with some examples of this task and then see whether it can solve the task on a new episode. But the other thing we can do is we can actually inject explanations into this learning process, this in-context learning process. So in particular, we can make the model generate, or we can give the model an explanation after an outcome, like the resulting dimension, the relevant dimension must not be texture if it didn't get a reward for a unique texture object. And then get it when it gets rewarded, it can get an explanation like I was rewarded for unique shape. 
or we can give the model a reasoning trace that tells it about the reasoning process for arriving at an answer. And what we're going to do is in the prompt, we'll give it some examples of explanations and reasoning traces, and that test time will test it in a new situation where it has to generate it, make its own choices, generate its own reasoning traces and explanations, and we'll see how well it can perform. So how this works is that we give the model a four-shot prompt, so four examples of this task where it gets expert choices and explanations and reasoning. And the prompt shots are sampled so that we only use two of the possible dimensions for the rewarding feature. For example, maybe color and shape are the only rewarding dimensions in the prompt, while the third one, texture, is held out, not rewarding in the prompt. We select, select the prompt automatically for performance on new tasks from the included color dimensions, like color and shape. So that's sort of our validation set. And we're going to evaluate performance on a task set of tests from the held out dimension. So first, I'm going to show you performance on the training dimensions. And what you can see on this graph is that Across all conditions, regardless of which uh, dimension is held out, the model is doing pretty well on the training tasks with explanations and reasoning in pink or without explanations in blue. Maybe it's doing a little bit worse without explanations, but not too much worse. Well above chance, which is here. However, if you look at performance on the held out dimensions that have never been observed in the prompt, the picture is very different. So again, the model that gets explanations and reasoning traces in the prompt is able to do well on these held out dimensions at test time, but the model that doesn't that only gets uh, the few shot examples, not the ex explanations or reasoning traces, is doing quite poorly, except perhaps in this case. And so what this suggests is that language models can learn these odd one out intervention tasks from examples in context, but they really need explanations of some form in order to generalize to a new dimension. Uh, we looked in the paper into which kind of explanations matter. It turns out that either giving the explanations or the reasoning before the choice will do, roughly speaking. They just need some sort of hint about the causal structure of the underlying task. Yeah. Okay. So with that, I want to wrap up and kind of reflect on what this says to us. So I started this talk by asking the question, well, Metaphorically, could you learn to be a scientist just by reading enough books, explaining experiments, and then go out and do scientific, make new scientific discoveries? And I think these results suggest that the answer is yes, at least in some cases. And that's especially because science books are designed to explain why an experiment was done, what was the strategy behind that causal process, and what do the results imply? To state our uh, conclusions a little more formally, while observational data does not generally allow learning causal structure itself, it's actually possible to learn these higher level strategies for actively experimenting to determine causal structure and then exploiting it from data that you only observe, at least as long as that data includes some examples of experts intervening. And I do wanna highlight that this is done without ever explicitly inferring a causal graph or giving the agent any explicit supervision with causal graphs just works implicitly. Um, this works in some toy causal graph structured environments and in some more complex ones with pixel observations and relations. Explanations can help support this causal learning and can shape how agents generalize from confounded data. And in general, I would say a theme of my work is that language is a powerful learning signal for many systems. And language models themselves can generalize causal strategies from a few shot prompt, at least if that prompt includes explanations. I think, if nothing else, this provides some footnotes on prior claims about language models and causality. Actually, these models could learn quite a bit about causality and experimentation just from observing data on the internet. I do want to highlight those some caveats and things this work doesn't imply. The first is that it doesn't imply that passive learning is as good as active learning. There's been a ton of experiments with animals, with humans, and with agents that show that passive learning is just worse. Uh, this is a particularly interesting and or horrifying neuroscience experiment along those lines. Uh, and behavioral cloning itself, at least in its unconditional forms, is fundamentally limited by the quality of data you have. And even if you ignore causality in these issues, getting active experience can be much more efficient because you can avoid repeating things you already know. So perhaps because of some of these reasons, most deployed language models are tuned with interactive objectives. And I expect they would improve these results, particularly in more complex cases. But the point of this paper is that passive data can go a long way. 
The other thing I want to highlight, of course, is that these results don't imply that confounding is not a problem. Explanations could overcome it in some cases, perhaps. Not every explanation on the internet is going to be right. And that leads me to my one of my questions of food for thought, which is, well, how good is the internet data actually for learning about things? Maybe the internet data looks more like this pile of trash over here. And indeed, there's lots of correct explanations on the internet, but also lots of conspiracy theories and other things and so on. So we assumed high quality expert data in our approach, but it would be interesting to explore relaxing this assumption. And perhaps even if you had bad data mixed in during training, you could fine tune at the end on some high quality data and recover the ability. The final question I want to leave you thinking about is how this connects to agency and goal-directed behavior. So if I showed you an agent, like an animal that was exploring and finding some structure of an environment and then exploiting that to achieve a goal, you would probably say that that animal was being agentic. It was doing goal-directed behavior, right? But what this work shows is that agents can be can learn this from purely passive learning, just like a language model gets, and language models can be pushed into it from just a prompt. So this raises the question, is there a deep and fundamental difference between the kind of internally driven goal-motivated agentic behavior that humans and animals exhibit and the kind of more prompt-driven behavior that these models exhibit? And I do want to highlight in that context that human behavior is very contextual as well. We do different things in different situations. And language models themselves do have default internally driven behavior, but perhaps it's a bit less coherent and more chaotic in self-conditioning than humans or animals are. So with that, I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk. And I want to thank all of my collaborators on these projects, uh, Stephanie, Ishida, Andrew, Jane, uh, Nick, Allison, Jan, Neil, Jay, Adam, and Felix. Thanks again, and happy to take some more questions. Hi, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Really interesting. Um, so one of the big problems with DAGs uh, that I've seen is that they fail to take into account simultaneity. So obviously if A and B are both interacting, then you get up with a cyclic subgraph. Um, have you considered looking at other methods of causal inference to try the same thing, uh, try the same sort of experiment? Or is there a way to consider elsewise? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think I, I mentioned at the end that we didn't ever explicitly infer any DAGs and we didn't ever supervise with them either. And I actually think that that's a strength of this method. And more generally, you know, one of the things that I think language gives you as a form of presenting causal structure that DAGs don't is a more flexible representational format that can easily accommodate things like interactive cycles in the causal structure, right? It's easy to say that in language. It's hard to represent that formally in a DAG or impossible in a DAG. Uh, so, I think that my bias is to think that there's more general representational forms that will be more powerful. And just like, you know, in machine learning over the past 10 years, we've gone away from structured representations for other kinds of problems. I think we will likely tend to go away from structured representations for causality and instead to representations that are learned and are perhaps shaped by more general signals like language and experience. But that's a hypothesis and, you know, plenty of people here in this room probably disagree with me about that and probably know a lot more about this than I do. So, yeah. Okay, I have a question here. Right here, down here? Yes. Yeah. Can you go to the slide, the, the most recent slide where you had Pearl's face? Oh, that's that's a long way back. No, but no, 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 it's this one. Oh, oh that no, one, this okay. One, this one. Yeah, next one. That's not Pearl. <laughs> oh wait, sorry. I think I might have lost my. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in the in the last sentence that you have at, at the footnotes, that you have language models could learn quite a bit about causality and experimentation from passive data. But language model, what do you mean by data? Because language models don't say you had these examples of Millikan's experiment on the Wikipedia. The language model didn't see the data of the experiment; it just saw an explanation of what the experiment is. So, what do you mean exactly by data? 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. Often the Wikipedia pages have descriptions of what occurred in an experiment, but there is a sense in which the model is not observing the experiment I mean, there's a very strong sense of which the model is not observing what happened in the way that the humans did. Um, I think maybe the, the simpler case to think about rather than debating about the philosophy of this and what counts as an experiment is the code case where we can generally agree that, you know, language models in lots of cases are deployed where they can execute code observe what happens and in training they see lots of examples of the code and what the output was and so that's more or less observing exactly the data that the humans saw and getting explanations of what happened and why um, so this is an easier case to think about i think than what's going on with these cases but i guess the the only point i make about this is that well you know maybe it would allow the system to at least suggest to a human what kinds of experiments they might want to try based on a description of a kind of phenomena they're interested in investigating. And that would sort of roughly map onto the kinds of cute experimentation experiments I did in the very toy settings earlier. Thanks. I think it's my turn, right? Someone else? No. Um, okay, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> Um, my question was around the fact that you provide the explanations both in the case where the agent is correct and in the case where the agent is incorrect. And I was just wondering, because also the example of like Stack Overflow and generally like any kind of code errors and those kind of things that we could use as explanations there, typically in the case where there's a failure mode, right? So it's they wouldn't necessarily tell you, this is really good, this is correct because you've done this thing, but just this is wrong. This is what you should change. Um, did you do any ablations or did you consider just using one or the other? Or is there any rationale behind using both? Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering uh, why in the, your experiments uh, do we focus in um, specific dimensions separately, color, shape, and texture? And why don't we combine them? Because I would expect in a more real case scenario, uh, a causality would be, uh, they are all different because they all have different shapes or this one is different because it has both shape and color. Um, that was my question. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And the answer is purely, I wanted to make these tasks really hard for the models. And this is a way to make them really hard because it gives the task that property where if you look at just a subset of the objects, you can't really tell which one is right. Um, so that's the reason that I made that choice was to make the tasks hard to le learn from reward alone. Um, it, they're sort of art very artificial tasks. I wouldn't read too much into them. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think I think this general approach can apply more broadly. So for example, we, in a slightly different context, we did a paper on presenting explanations to language models in a few shot prompt. And there we were focusing on harder problems. And while language models are somewhat unreliable, we did see a significant improvement across a range of problems from giving explanations in the prompt. And there the structures were slightly more of things people would care about. Great question. All right. Uh, hi. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so I'm not sure if this is what you were getting at uh, in the end, but in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, explanations are really um, fundamental to how humans learn. Um, but I would argue that uh, in actually human explanation situations, they are dynamic and interactive. And so a lot of the time I would explain something to somebody, I would try to figure out what is this exactly that he needs. And so is this what you were getting at when you mentioned interactive training? And do you have any concrete ideas how we could exploit this idea? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
in the paper, we did some, the original paper on explanations, we did some experiments with that, where basically we gave explanations that were relevant to a situation, but not relevant to the agent's behavior. And we showed those were much less useful. So basically the argument was, oh, you do need this kind of interactive explanation that responds to what the agent is doing in order to get good learning. Um, so we do see some analogs of that phenomenon, definitely. Uh, but I think that, you know, the more realistic situations where you'd want to use something like this is where you'd be getting explanations from humans when a system does something wrong. Like you can think of explanations as being a better way of interacting with the system in some sense than just giving it like, this was a good answer or this was a bad answer. And so for example, when people are doing uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback for language models, you could think of a human just giving a natural language explanation along with whether they liked one answer or another. And that might help the system to learn about what's going on. And in those cases, generally, the answers that the system produ it produces, the answers that are presented to the human are actually answers that the system has produced. And so you are getting this kind of active feedback on exactly the mistakes that the system is making. So I think that in more realistic situations where you'd want to use this, you'd kind of naturally get that. Hi, can you hear? Thanks for a great talk. Um, I have a question about your last slide. It's very interesting. So basically, a lot of people are seems they are trying to condition the data, you said, because the, the internet is unconditioned. So um, what do you think about models who were trained on just code data or textbook data? Is there two papers? And it seems like they improved the reasoning capacity. So is, is it a emerging capacity or is it something that latent and then it just emerged because we condition it later thanks a lot sorry i don't know why that keeps turning off um yeah i think there's some deep questions about what exactly models learn from a large data mix and how it sort of decomposes in their learning process that we don't fully understand so you know Mixing something like code into the data at a higher density seems to improve the model's reasoning, and we're not entirely sure why, other than some vague ideas about the fact that you know code has more structure and it's harder to infer without doing reasoning and so on. But I think that the it's definitely the case that with these models, you get behavior that's both biased by the frequency with which things appear in the training data and also with the association of the context with that behavior within the training data. So if you take a model that's trained on less code, but you inject more code into the prompt, you can sometimes get better reasoning than otherwise. Or if you take a model that's trained on a wide range of data, but you give it some sort of expert prompt, you can sometimes get better behavior out of it than you would from the naive model. So there's some sort of cooperation between, you know, this sort of baseline bias from the overall data mix and the sort of contextual bias from conditioning on some particular information. And that's, you know, both a good thing in that you can pull a lot of behavior out of the model at test time that you m might not have known how to sift through the training data to find, but it's also a bad thing because people can prompt inject the model and also pull a lot of behavior out of it at test time that you that you didn't really want to be in there. So I think it's a, a complicated question and a complicated problem for the people who are actually trying to deploy these models in the real world. I hope we'll have some better answers on it soon. Hi, down here on your left. Thank oh, you. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, just a question about like, from what I understood, you give some explanations to the agent and on that you assume that it understands and it improves the performance. So by the way, I, impressive improvement in the performance, but have you a way to evaluate that indeed it's X, what you think it does? Because we have, you know, we evaluate many things, some metrics, but eventually we don't really know. So if you have a way to make it more transparent, you know, increase transparency and understand that indeed it learned what we think it learned. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm just going to straight up say that I don't have a way of assessing real understanding. Uh, on the other hand, 
I think that that was somewhat true even when I was teaching humans. Like I used to teach math classes, and when I was explaining things to calculus to people, sometimes it would seem like they understood, and I would feel like they understood, and they would answer my the like question right on the quiz, and then I would grade their exam, and I would be like, oh, they definitely didn't understand this concept. So I think it's actually a fairly complicated question, even for more intelligent systems than these toy ones.、Um, And I think it's the kind of question that might be hard to get a final answer on, even with even if you can get internal access to the system, unless you design the system for it. But in that case, you often bias the system away from having the kinds, the full range of capabilities that you would want. Yeah, yeah totally understand, and I agree that even if you grade the exam and the exam is good, you. You don't know if it understands. Yeah, I just want to know if there's a way to interpret them post hoc. Let's.、Yeah. I don't know anyway.、Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I wish I did. Hi, sorry. Said another question. Did you、uh, attempt to get the system to learn any counterfactual reasoning? Yeah, that's a great question.、Uh, I didn't try that, but. I think that it would be equally plausible with similar kinds of processes.、Um, I would be very interested in investigating it in language models. And the one of the papers that I pointed to on this、uh, Kitchman paper on sort of like causal reasoning with language models highlighted that as a possibility as well. So I definitely think it's something people are thinking about. But I haven't done any work there, and I'm not aware of any at the moment. So. Interesting question. Hi,、um, I thought that the fact that you put a different head on for the explanations was really interesting, and I wondered whether, because with a language model, we don't want it to output the explanation, right? We want it to just learn from the explanation. Do you think that there's a lot more research that can be done in this kind of alternate head? And where that distribution might be dealing, where it kind of meets with the kind of output head, or wherever it should get kind of stuck in along that chain. I think that's a super interesting question. So,、uh, you know, the reason I did a separate head on the agents, just to be clear, is because the agent policy is quite is not language structured. It's just taking actions in some environment, like moving around for the agents in the two D and three D environments, and so it's kind of a it's forced on me by the constraints of the paradigm. But that said, I do think it could be interesting for language models to have this sort of extra explanation output. There has been a Bit of work that's done things that I could think of as being a bit like that. I guess the trade-off to it is that you actually might want the model to share knowledge that it learns from the explanation process with its general outputting process, and vice versa. And so there's kind of a constraint there where you. You do want to be able to explain without outputting that to the user. Maybe they don't need to see it, but you also want the model to integrate knowledge across both those processes, perhaps in a more fundamental way than these agents were.、Um, and so, I don't know what the right architecture for that is. Maybe it would look something more like the model could still use a single head, but then it gets to decide which parts are just sort of internal thoughts and which parts are output to the user. Or something else, but I think that there's a lot of interesting work that could be done in that space. Hello. Okay. Well,、uh, just one question. So I've I've seen like explanations might help when you want to、um, learn from passive data. What kind of properties do you think it would be like really hard to to learn only from passive data, or whether there's room for learning from interactions with the, that supervised learning might not achieve? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, I, I think there's a, a couple of things that are worth highlighting. So, it just keeps turning off instantly.、Uh, okay, so 
first of all, I think that interactive learning should almost always be more efficient if you do it right than passive learning. Because again, at least because you're not repeating things you already know. Um, but more fundamentally, like passive learning is going to impose some constraints on how much better than the data you can do, right? So if you have a language model reading text on the internet, it's probably limited from inferring fundamentally new physics that we've never discovered because it just you know can't perform the experiments to try them out and to validate that, right? So I don't, it's not obvious what the exact extent of those limitations is because with conditional bc like in decision transformer upside down rl you can actually get some at least modest improvement over what the training data the policy the training data was generated from so it's not like you can't get anything better than the data out of the data but maybe what you can get is that most sort of like this idea of stitching together fragments of the data and you can't get something fundamentally new in some way but i don't think we really know how to characterize what is fundamentally new and what is just stitching together fragments of the data at the scale of learning that language models are doing and so i think that's part of the problem it's just we don't have a good notion of what is novel in this kind of massive distribution that these systems are learning from. We don't have a good way of even characterizing that distribution. That makes it hard to say anything too formal about what these systems could fundamentally be limited from doing.